Good, robust discussion about double gloving this morning. Um, before we start that, I wanted to just thank ACORN for letting me be here and importantly to thank Ansel as the sponsors of this session. Medical industry are important players um, in our quest for better patient outcomes and for safer healthcare worker um, working conditions. So thank you to Ansel for supporting the session. So what I always like to do, and this is because of my background working in government, is just to draw your attention to the fact that I do work independently. I'm not employed by any hospital. Um, and I do consult to medical device companies and in this case I'm sponsored today by Ansel. That said, please know that none of the content of this presentation has been um, put together by Ansel, that all of the views that I'm going to put forward to you are my own and they're based on my own reading, my own research, my understanding of healthcare worker safety. So um, it is important though that you're aware of that relationship. So I guess that one of the questions when I was asked to write this abstract was, I wrote it, the title, calling it Blood, Sweat and Tears in my mind because as an infection preventionist or infection control nurse, I see the sad side of occupational exposures when nurses used to come knocking at my door and they'd had an exposure and they were very distressed. So I actually was on the plane yesterday morning and I looked at the title again and I went, you know what, it's blood, sweat and tears and I thought it's really all about gloves and how strong gloves are or what the problems are so I'm going to leave it with you to see if you think it's tears or tears and we can take a look at that at the end but at the essence of this presentation is an attempt by me to try and answer this question you know is it safe enough to wear one glove or should you wear two or perhaps should you even wear more than two gloves routinely and a couple of things that came to my mind yesterday when I was presenting was that in 1984 I was a newly registered nurse and it was the middle of Australia's Medicare dispute so there was not much activity happening in the public hospitals and I don't know if any of you remember that but I wanted to go into the operating rooms and work in that area. The only way I could do that was to work in the private sector which was not a great place for a young newly registered nurse to go. And what happened was I ended up doing a lot of orthopaedic surgery, really long hours, insanely long hours, and we didn't have any training, we didn't have interns and residents, so I actually did a lot of retracting and my hands were in dark, dark sharp places in, in dangerous environments. And I used to routinely put on two pairs of gloves. But when I started doing that, everyone else said to me, you know, Kath, you won't like wearing two pairs of gloves because your hands will feel tight, you'll feel constricted. And I didn't even really take time to make up my own mind. I assumed that what the senior sister was telling me, as always, was correct. And I don't know that that's the safest way for us to practice in terms of just looking at the way things have always been done. So as I've matured, and you know that was a long time ago, as I've matured and, and have become more qualified and, and done my own research, I've realised that looking at evidence is really important. And so I'm going to share some evidence with you today around this whole issue. And we'll find out, just out of interest, who here routinely wears two pairs of gloves for every surgery? Okay, so I hope you'll realise that that's a good thing. Does anybody wear three pairs? Okay. Well, I've got a bit of a struggle. I'm not going to take you to three pairs. But the topics that I will address are, I want to talk to you about your specialness. What makes you the special group? And you really are, in my mind, very special because it's where I began, but I think that you've got a unique role. We'll talk about that. You're up there kind of with intensive care unit nurses and, let me say, midwives, but I don't put them in the same category. And you're special because your risks are very different to people who are working as generalist nurses in a hospital setting. We'll look at the, all of the evidence around double gloving that I'm aware of, and maybe you might know other things. And then I want to talk to you about the positions that we have in terms of public policy. So when I talk about public policy, I'm talking about the infection control guidelines that the national government put out. I'm talking about things like the ACORN standards. And I'm going to talk to you about our laws and regulations. And what happens is if you align those three things, you'll see that they don't always give the same advice and instruction, which is tricky because it makes us quite confused. 
when you're trying to find what's the right, correct and honest thing to do. Even with all of that guidance and with the evidence, there's practical issues in the operating room that are special. And those practical issues are things like speed, uh, organisation, resources, availability of gloves, all sorts of things. And then I will spend a bit of time talking to you about decision making. Because in the last five years in my world of infection control, what expert researchers are finding is a whole lot of new evidence around why people choose to follow or choose not to follow particular infection control measures. And I think it's fascinating because we'll spend more time on it, let me say that, but it probably is the most interesting part of infection control because who, who really wants to hear about hand hygiene? Anyway, that's just a little joke for those of you that might be sick to death of hand hygiene, which is a good thing. So. All of these reasons here are why you're special. You're special because you work in a very ordered and usually well-controlled environment, which is unlike some of the other environments in the hospital. But it may be ordered, but in a nanosecond like that, it can become quite chaotic. So you never know what's going to come through the doors. You know, a massive head injury, gunshot wound, aortic aneurysm, uh, caesarean section, all of the things that I remember used to just drive us from calm and collected to emergency setting. So it's, a, it's an ever-changing, ever-stressful environment that's unpredictable. The other thing that happens is, and I don't know how you feel about this, but many times during the day, you guys are in an environment where you can't use your normal senses. You often don't see natural light, so you're denied that. You're surrounded by gases, anaesthetic gases and other things, and bone cement and uh, diathermy plume and all of those other horrible smells. So your normal senses are right off. You probably rush out to eat so you don't get to enjoy your coffee breaks as much necessarily as everybody else. So you really are in a, in a, in a way a sense of denied. And then someone comes along and says put on a couple of pairs of gloves and you lose your sense of touch which is also an important touch. So I kind of feel sorry for you because you're a bit like living in this little bubble. But that's all, it's good and it's where you need to be. The other thing that happens is people come along and say at a young age, here's the aseptic area or the sterile area. And so you can only move in that, you've got very limited movement. And ergonomically that's challenging as well. And you know, you can't turn around, you can't do all those things just to maintain asepsis. So there's some physical challenges. There's certainly enormous mental challenges. You are distracted. There's a lot of activity in a typical operating room. You're performing under stress. So my hat's off to you. Um, I didn't cope all that well in a stressful environment, but I haven't actually found too many nursing environments that are relaxing anyway, so <laughs> you might as well be in one that's ordered and controlled. What makes it particularly concerning for occupational exposures is that typically you're working in areas where visualisation is poor. So dark, crowded areas where there are lots of hands and lots of sharp instruments. So it's a bit of a no-brainer that there's a high potential for sharps injury and needle stick injury and occupational splashes to occur in here around jagged edges of instruments particularly. But not only at the operative site, also when you're cleaning up your trolley or when you're cleaning your instruments or you're getting them ready to be reprocessed. So when I talk about this whole double glove thing, I will probably focus more on the, what's happening at the surgical field, but I'm also talking about that extended environment where you have contact with sharp instruments as well, so keep that in mind. All right, the things that can happen here, uh, you can have a splash, so you can have a mucosal membrane contact, and in the best operating theatres where staff are completely compliant, we see them wearing their shields and their face masks. And I can't tell you, nobody here is from RPA Hospital in Sydney, are they? Do any of you, have any of you watched that series and you've seen them operating and they don't have all their PPE on? It kind of drives you crazy, doesn't it? And I watch it and I go, oh God, so I've got to change channel. But, you know, these, there are many things. And so what it says to me is that humans' choices to comply are important. And that's why we need to understand a lot more about them. Because there's three other ways you can be exposed that I know of. You can have an aerosolization of blood. So that would be, you know, just a spraying that happens. And that can hit you anywhere in the operating room. So you get a spurting artery and, and you are potentially a target. You can have cutaneous contact, typically on your hands. 
or you could have a needle stick injury. And the worst types of needle stick injuries, just as a heads up to share with you, are deep penetrating injuries with fresh blood into a fleshy part of your body. And they're usually the types that you have with a scalpel, a hypodermic needle, or um, you know, a sharp edge of, of an operating room instrument. So a little bit scary from that perspective. And we know a fair bit about occupational exposures in the operating room. We don't know a lot about Australian occupational exposures, but we know from global research. About 20% of all surgeries have a Sharps injury occurring in them. That's the estimate, but it's based on a, it is an estimation because if you looked, if I was running an infection control program in a hospital and I showed you the data that I collected week after week after week for a year, it would represent about 50% of all the injuries because half of the general hospital staff don't report their injuries. Now in operating theatres, 70% of the staff don't report their injuries. Why do you think that is? Paperwork. They don't like the infection control department. Nobody wants to go out of the operating room and get changed any more than they need to. And then they're probably, so all of those reasons, and I think they're very valid reasons. So, you know, a smart infection control occupational health and safety department would have some system that made it a whole lot easier for you to report. Nevertheless, my plea to you is, please do report these injuries when you have them for your own sake but also for the sake of your peers because we need to know how you're having them so that we can actually try and protect, prevent them and protect you and your peers. Now, one of you or some of you may be asking me, have I ever met anyone who's become HIV positive from an operating room exposure? And the answer, unfortunately, is yes, I have. I never really thought that I would um, because these events are rare, but they're very real and the risk never goes away. So the other thing with HIV particularly is that, you know, 25 years ago we started worrying about it, 30 years ago a lot of people were not living with their HIV. Now what we have is people who are positive, who thank God are surviving. But what happens is you've got a larger pool of people that are HIV positive. And, and many of you who've been in the field for a longer time might not take that into consideration. So you can have the very well who can be, you know, potentially infectious for you. So. These issues are real. I'm very passionate about them. I have spent about 25 years fighting to get the Australian government, state governments and various bodies to bring in safer, sharps devices. And I'll show you how that argument's been. So if you hear me get passionate and you see me pull face, facial expressions, it is because I'm very passionate about this. And I'm actually scared that I'll retire and we won't have found the solutions to this in Australia, that we won't have mandatory legislation that we need. And that's very sad because I know in other countries like America, Canada, in the European Union countries, they've all mandated safety engineered devices and we've not yet. And it's an absolute disgrace. So I put that out there and if anyone from government hears it, good luck. They'll, they know how I feel anyway. So in the operating room, it is suture needles that cause problems, but hypodermic needles also cause us problems and scalpels do as well. And I guess that that probably is not surprising to you. As I said to you, I'm passionate about it. And I show my passion in lots of different ways. One of the ways that I do it is that about every three years, I write a complaining scientific paper. And I do the estimations of what our needle stick injury rate is on bits of data that are coming out. And last year, I had this one published. And I believe that we probably have about 20,000 needle stick injuries in Australian hospitals alone. And of those, probably about six and a half thousand occur in operating rooms. And you can go back if you ever want to read that paper or email me. I'm more than willing to share it with you. So it's a concerning issue and that six and a half thousand Australian operating room nurses or staff that don't need to be potentially exposed. Because exposure is costly. It's time consuming. More importantly, it's stressful for the healthcare workers and it puts our system under stress. So in that operating room, where is the most dangerous part? Probably the scrub sink because that's where you walk into the theatre. But the point of this slide is that there's really no safe area in the operating room. Any area is a potential area for you to have a needle stick injury or an occupational exposure. But for those of you that do work in instrumentation handling, this is where 
almost 60% of the injuries happen. At the surgical wound site or within that surgical, surgical field. Anesthetic, I'm not sure, perhaps more controlled, but this I would suspect is around that poor visualisation. Now this paper is a little bit old, so I will concede it is an old paper, but when you look at all of the data that we have, needle stick injury data hasn't changed terribly much other than when people introduce safety engineered devices. How do we reduce these risks in theatres? These are proven strategies. If we educate people, so thanks for coming along and listening because you might just save your life, you might save somebody else's. When people are experienced, that tends to be protective. But it's only protective if the experience that you're showing is good practice. So if you were a dud at infection control 25 years ago, and you discounted recommendations, and you've continued to have that attitude in your career, and you haven't changed with the times and you haven't kept up, experience won't help you. And you, might, you won't be doing that from a malicious intent. You might be doing it because the system's not allowing you to remain current. The system's not giving you the tools, the resources, the policy support, all of those other things. If you are a stellar infection control performer and you are experienced, please feel free to go on and educate the next generation because they need it. They come in, they're fresh and they don't understand personal protective equipment. And I'll share a very personal and hopefully you'll find it a funny story later on in the presentation where I show you how experience makes a difference. The preparation that you have, so the equipment that you use, the conditions you're working in, the consideration you give to that also helps mitigate that risk and your attitude will as well. So whether you can be calm and orderly, whether you can be confident whether you know how to use the equipment and then you could have all four of those things in place and lady luck or sir luck comes along and screws up your day or makes your day. So some of it is just in the lap of the gods and we can't do anything about it. Nevertheless, we will always like to see the first four things done properly. So this is a, a study done by Janine Jagger, who I think is the world's leading expert on occupational exposures and particularly Sharps injuries. And Janine did this study in, I think, about six US operating rooms over 17 months. And they looked at the body parts of theatre staff and where they had their injuries. Now, a couple of things. I look at this and I think, yep, they're, they're good size, they're healthy operating room staff, but actually almost all of their body is at risk and have at some stage potentially had a needle stick injury. They're small numbers, particularly when you think about the fact that 93% of all injuries in the operating room occur to the hands. So therefore, if you need to take protection of any part of your body, it's your hands that you need to protect. Okay, so 93.3% of hands. And that's why things like double gloving are so important for us because it's protective and protective of your hands when you have the injury. You may not be aware of it or you may understand it, I don't know, but it's usually the non-dominant hand that is affected. And that makes sense to us because if someone's suturing, you know, they'll be suturing with their dominant hand or they'll be cutting with their dominant hand and this will be their target. And the forefinger is a problem. Um, please don't feel that you have to take notes for this because I'm sure that Evren or the team from Ansel will share it with you and if they won't, I will. So feel free, it's, it's out there to help you. And I know that they will share it with you and they do lots of good things. Um, there's also often, just as an aside to the presentation, uh, a nice little newsletter that we write and publish called Epic. And that often has infection control information and Sharps injury information in it. So you can get a copy of that. Why do we want to prevent these exposures? Many, many reasons. I've talked about the cost, obviously, is a problem. The fear and stress that the healthcare worker goes through is, is the real concern for me because it's ruined people's lives. For that period where they're waiting for their results and it can be the first lot of results at about six weeks or it can be all the way through to six months or 12 months, that can be an incredibly scary time for healthcare workers. They don't know where they are. They're kind of in a bit of a limbo and not sure whether or not they've been um, inadvertently exposed. So there's an emotional cost that happens to these healthcare workers. There's also obviously fiscal costs. So time and, and effort and machinery and supplies that are used in assessing, managing, treating and following up. 
and people have done these costs. It, it seems to be about $3,000 for an uncomplicated injury that's followed up and reported properly to someone who goes on and perhaps needs a liver transplant because they've acquired hepatitis C. It can be in the value of hundreds of thousands. The other thing is that there's a cost for the hospital. So there's an organisational cost which is around compensation, litigation. The other cost is the cost to your team. So if you're the NUM or you're in charge of staffing or you're one of the very stressed and overworked operating room staff that aren't in a managerial position, if one of your mates goes off work with post-traumatic stress after an injury, that gives you a cost because you're down staff. So, you know, and if someone needs to be replaced, there's also the cost of replacing them. So lots of other things need to be redeployed, need to change your career, all of those sorts of things. Sometimes we don't think through the logic of it. If you adopt safer behaviours like proper use of PPE and using double gloves particularly and safety engineered devices, you can reduce your risk of exposure. Also following recommendations is really important, but I will share with you what I think is some ambiguity in the recommendations. And so what I'll ask you when we look at those is to always read recommendations and see what references the authors have used to base that recommendation upon. because. The science is evolving much faster than a guideline. I don't know if any of you have worked on the ACORN standards, but I would imagine for them to be updated it takes several years. I've worked on two versions of the Australian Infection Control Guidelines, sat on the government committees for them, and both times it's been at least seven years from the time we start the project to the time that people end up with a physical copy of that document. And in that seven years, the research changes enormously. And then the document comes out and it sits and it's current in terms of the government's mind for about another seven years. So you might be looking at research that's 14 years old and basing your practice on that. And that's where I think we are with our recommendation on double gloving, just quietly. I'll show you about it. Use your equipment safely, use your PPE, and let's talk about this issue of double gloves specifically. <coughs> So I've outlined, a, a, I hope, a clear argument for you. I've shown you a little bit about why you are special. Let's look about what it means for you as a perioperative team or a perioperative individual. I last spoke on this topic four years ago, and I have to say it's moved pace quite significantly. But if you weren't in Perth, I'm going to recap just on the most important points of that presentation. What we found in these three studies were that about nurses don't always wear PPE properly. So this study is not an OR study, it's, it's a ward-based study, but it shows us that nurses can sometimes even neglect to use gloves altogether. And I know that that would never happen at the surgical site, but it may happen in the instrument room. It may happen in the anaesthetic bay where you're cleaning up something that's sharp. So that's concerning. It's concerning that people think that they can get away with this and that there's no, there's no real um, puniation for them. And, you know, as, as we look around, and I'm, I was standing here before thinking, you know, there's danger signs all around us here. There's a no smoking sign, there's a keep clear sign, there's a do not obstruct the fire safety door, and people are, are complying with that. But in healthcare, we just go, no, I'm not going to comply. It's my decision today, I don't feel like complying. And it's not because we feel that we want to be Dexter. We don't want to be serial killers. We don't want to harm ourselves, but sometimes we just get distracted or the system doesn't enable us to comply. But we need to look at that and do a better job. And that's why we need to understand your injuries so that you can, we, can, we can work collectively as clinicians with government, with medical device manufacturers and come up with solutions that are meaningful and work for you. When gloves are compromised, there's an opportunity for pathogens to go both ways. So you could have skin flora, you could have bugs on your hands, staph, staph epidermidis, you could have some pseudomonas on your hands, although that's unlikely. You could have staph aureus on your hands, and it can go through micro perforations in your gloves. So that's the tear part of the glove title. The other thing, of course, is that the patient's blood and body fluids can come onto your hands, and if your hands are cut, you may have a problem, you may potentially have an issue. We know that the perforation depends on the type and duration of surgery and also the role of the wearer. So if you're the surgeon, there's some risks. If you're the OR nurse, handing instrumentation, different risks, different wear and tear. 
And we know that double gloving is a workable alternative in some situations. Now, we've been talking here now for nearly, or I've been talking, you've been patiently listening for about 30 minutes, which is about half the time it takes typically for a glove to develop a tear. So if you're ever in a procedure that goes longer than about 62 minutes, there's a potential for your glove to automatically be torn. You may not have realized that, it's quite short life for a glove. And in one of the studies I'll show you, you can see that even it takes less than that. In some studies, it's been as low as 22 minutes. There's another thing I want to share with you which fascinated me, and I understand it, I accept it, and I think I, I do need to tell you. So it's kind of, it's not a secret, it's public, but just listen hard. If you open up a box of 100 gloves, the standard of production for those 100 gloves that's acceptable is that five of them can have a micro tear or a perforation and they're still sellable to you. So that's okay if you get glove number one to 95, but if you get 96, 97, and, or 98, 99, or whatever five are in there, that could be a problem for you. So if you wear double gloves, your chances of twice getting one of those five pairs that have a tear in it are reduced as well. So micro tears are a real issue, and just by putting on one pair of gloves, you don't necessarily assume, particularly after 62 minutes, that they are an effective barrier. So there's been lots and lots of studies done in a systematic review that showed when one pair of gloves was worn, perforation was about 10%. When two pairs of gloves were worn, the inner glove, so the one touching your skin, perforation reduced significantly to 2%. The outer glove perforation rate stayed about the same. When people wore three pairs of gloves, we got down to zero. So three may be the future. I don't know. We'll see what I hopefully present in two years on the same topic, and we'll see where the research has taken us. But definitely, there's a protective fact in my mind to wearing two pairs of gloves. So there's that statistically significant, all the p-values, those things that scare us, shows that double gloving reduced the risk of compromising the protective function of gloves. And this paper says that protection is a contact factor of about 10 to the power of 2. So pretty good protection. In this study, which was an Australian study, and that makes it quite unique and good for us, they measured concentration of bacteria going through glove punctures. And not going into all the detail of it, what they found was that perforations and transmission in the non-dominant hand, bacterial passage, was detected in about 5% of the gloves, so these bugs get through, with the potential to seed and to cause post-surgical site infection. Because as you know, most of the surgical site infections we see, particularly those deep organ space surgical site infections, happen at the time of surgery. They don't happen afterwards, unfortunately. So this paper concluded, depending on how long you wear the glove, micro perforations might not necessarily be seen by staff at the time that they happen, but they do allow passage of bacteria. And one of the ways that we can reduce that passage of bacteria is by wearing double gloves and by changing them at a duration of about 90 minutes. And maybe you don't even have a routine um, change policy at your hospitals. One of the other things that I realized when I was thinking about other ways we're approaching infection control, doing a lot of monitoring, I don't know of any hospital in Australia that actually monitors glove usage and compliance with glove recommendations. I think that's probably not a bad way to go. And I'd really like to see some research done around it, but even from a risk management point of view, it wouldn't be a bad idea in my mind to start monitoring glove wearing and glove usage, particularly double gloves, if you decide to go down that position, and I think it's the right one to take. So I said to you that this research is speeding ahead and it's very interesting, and it, indeed it is. So I'll show you these papers and copies of them you can get if you contact me. This is a study of just what causes healthcare workers to use gloves. What are the factors that they take into consideration? There's a couple of points that are interesting. I've highlighted them. First one is in the findings here. About 40% of the time, healthcare workers use gloves inappropriately. So it's confusing, and people make those problems. But what was more concerning is that someone's decision to wear gloves 
or to wear one pair or two pairs was influenced by emotional factors rather than good common sense. So that thing where we judge, we prejudge patients or we prejudge a situation, and that may be good. It may be fine, particularly when you're in an ordered, controlled environment. But I started off by saying to you, you're special and you're chaotic and you're denied sense and all those other things that are reasonable. So sometimes your emotion and your ability to make clinical judgment is going to go out the window. So keep that in mind as we go ahead. Now this is a really elegant study just very recently published from Hong Kong. And what they found here was the average duration for tears was 69.8 minutes. Sorry, I, I led you astray by seven minutes. So nearly around 70 minutes you'll get a perforation in the glove. And that when people used double gloving, they had a much lower level of um, perforation and particularly of that inner glove. So it reaffirms what we'd already known. And what they say here is double gloving is indeed effective in protecting operating room nurses against bloodborne pathogens. It should be introduced as a routine practice. Now, thank God and all congratulations, kudos, recon recognition and my great thanks to ACORN and any of you who wrote the standards because in your standards that is your recommendation. Unfortunately, not so in the government policy. We'll look at it. This is a curious piece of work just published as well. And it's about what happens in terms of contamination of your surgical scrubs or your clothing in the ward when you wear one pair of gloves versus two pairs of gloves. I'll, I'll tell it to you in CAF speak rather than in scientific speak. But what they found is that if you had two pairs of gloves on compared to one, far less virus was transmitted to your clothing. So a smaller volume and also much less frequent occasions of transfer. So that's good in terms of your scrubs not getting contaminated and then you inadvertently touching your scrubs or running your hands down and then going and doing something else with your hands. So it, it, I think it's a very interesting piece of research. Remember I said to you 30 years ago, all right, that's all I can remember 30 years ago, I didn't want to wear two pairs of gloves because I thought I'd feel constrained and claustrophobic. And that was actually just because that idea was fed to me. And what's happened is that very recently in the UK, this fellow who's an engineer has done some very intensive tests of gloves and their tensile pressures and other aspects of them. And he's found actually that there is no impact on sensation or touch associated with wearing an extra pair of gloves. So what I'd contest to you today is that when we go, oh, it's constraining, it's probably because we're expecting it to feel like that. And in the years, you know, since 30 years ago, and 10 years ago, and in, even in the last couple of years, glove manufacturers become so much more sophisticated and so much more comfortable, and the materials and the designs are so much better that, in fact, this probably is not the case at all. So. If you've been around the traps for a while, just have a bit of an honest internal dialogue with yourself if you're not routinely wearing double gloves. And then surgeons were recently studied and they were asked about their sense. And again, they found double gloving does not have any impact on manual handling or tactile sensation compared with either using no gloves or one pair of gloves. So we've got it. We've got it through the scientific test. We've got it through a bunch of surgeons that have been studied and we know it's protective. So the recommendations, in a nutshell, to get through this in time, they're foggy. We ha who knows these, the national standards? Who knows standard three? <coughs> Don't you hate it? <laughs> it's a scary document, takes a long time to understand it. It's quite boring, but it does have relevant sections for us. 3.7 is all about occupational health and safety. And in here it talks about personal protective equipment, managing occupational exposures, and evaluating new procedures and new products, which to me includes things like use of double gloving. Now, these standards, I sat on the committee that wrote these as well. They took us about four years to write, and I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm proud that I sat on the committee that wrote these, but the evidence that we used has changed rapidly. There's no way that these are informed with current evidence. So keep that in mind. The other thing that double gloves do, because they don't get torn, the inner glove, as much as the outer glove, is that they help us with sterility and they help us maintain that sense of asepsis, which is mandatory and mandated through standard 3.10, through standard 3, criteria 3.10.
And what this standard is telling us <coughs> is that we need to make sure we have action to increase our compliance with asepsis. And to me, action about this would be something like an audit of glove wearing and double gloving. So that's how I see it as being important. Now, this beautiful and august document from 2010, what does it have to say about double gloving? It's actually what it doesn't say about double gloving. It's very ambiguous. It says you can, but you don't have to. And I find that concerning. It also says something which is now wrong in my mind. And that is, it says there's no demonstrated improvement for wearing double gloves. The reason that it says that is because of that point. They're using research from, 20, from 2007, whereas now we have the hindsight of more current research, which has shown the protective aspect of it. So keep that in mind whenever you're looking at an infection control recommendation, that evidence changes and the guidelines will never keep up. It's like a constantly converging lines. So they also do say that in some surgeries, wear double gloves, so they contradict each other as well. Now, I think this is a problem because whenever you give healthcare workers choice, they have an option to follow it or not. And when you introduce choice, it means they have to make a decision. Whereas if you standardise practice, it becomes your habit and you will habitually do that. So if you can standardise the best practice, that's fantastic. And in infection control for the last 30 years, we've been all about standardising practice, standard precautions, apply them to everybody. So why would we introduce decision making? What we have to make sure in infection control and in operating rooms especially, is that your minimum standard of practice is safe. You can go safer, and you can go to safest, but please promise me that your minimum will always be safe. And that's safe for you and safe for the patient and safe for the organisation. Okay, so minimum has to be safe, but you can go higher, which is perhaps where three gloves takes us to. And in all of this, at the essence of Australia, when guidelines fail, when accreditation fails, we have law. And the law says where we know there's a problem, we have to manage it, we have to mitigate it. So this is a great reason to mitigate by wearing double gloves. As I said to you, well done ACORN, so congratulations to Steve, your CEO, and to everybody else that was involved in this. Double gloving is recommended practice. So maybe if you went to a court of law and there was a problem and you got judged, you'd be judged against these standards. And you might have a case to answer to if you weren't double gloved. Or you may, it may impact your rights to compensation. So I think that these are pretty important documents and they say the right thing in my mind. But there's practical issues. We need to understand what's driving operating room nurses' behaviour. Is it experience? Is it knowledge? Is it just their, their way of making those decisions? Somehow, we think a lot of non-compliance in infection control is driven by the fact that your performance will be reduced. And I've shown you the evidence that says there's nothing that's gonna reduce your performance if you wear two gloves. So you're not gonna have less tactile, you're not gonna have more stress on your hands, any of those things. All right, now this very clever, zen, relaxed, ex-operating room nurse is me, and I'm a photographer in my other life, and in fact, I've just started a photography degree. So for 12 weeks, I'm completing my first semester, and I'm loving it, but there's a couple of problems in it. I haven't yet learnt how to be completely safe in that degree. So this is me the week that I started the degree and I thought I'll see how it ages me at the end. The other problem is of course that I'm surrounded by 18 year olds who are fast and young and have good eyesight and can do great things. But the other day I had a, a, an issue which just hit me out of the blue and this is what happened. I was developing film and I don't know if any of you have ever done that but it's a hard thing to do. You have to put film onto a reel and do all these sorts of things and you have to wear gloves because you've got these deadly chemicals in the dark room that can hurt you if they get into your eyes or they do this. So we have to wear PPE. And when I started the course 12 weeks ago or 13 weeks ago, we had to do a few things. I had to do a half an hour online training session. I then had to answer a multiple choice quiz. The other thing that happens in this dark room, unlike our hospitals, is that we are under constant closed circuit telemetry. And the other day I was rushing because I knew I had to get to Melbourne, I had to finish this presentation, I had to get into infection control mode and out of artist mode and photographer mode. 
and I ran in there, I had a roll of film and half an hour before a lecture to develop it, and that's just about the minimum time you need. And I started playing with my chemicals. All of a sudden, along came the PPE Nazi, and he said, you, out. I was like, oh my God, you know, here's me who's telling everybody to wear PPE all their life, and I'd forgotten about it. So it really hit me home about two things. First of all, I'm practiced in a hospital environment. I've got a good standard way of working in a hospital environment, but this is my new environment. And I don't know what to do, and I didn't have any role models because I've only got my 18-year-old friends who are at the same stage. So those things are tricky, and you don't do the right thing. The other thing that I found amazing in that whole journey is the degree of um, surveillance that we're under and the fact that someone is permissioned to come in and kick us out and to stop us from progressing in our degree if we don't do the right thing. And perhaps in healthcare, we need to be a bit stricter. You know, why do we accept less than perfect in healthcare? Anyway, I hope you enjoyed seeing that. And if ever you any need photos done, let me know. <laughs> so with our gloves, I said to you, they're getting better. They're more comfortable. They look prettier. What's important? All of these things are really important in a glove. The fit, how sensitive they are, how flexible they are, whether or not they feel slippery. And so glove manufacturers around the world look at this and they look at it for two pairs. It's problematic when you make that decision. And I talked a little bit about that, so I won't labour it, other than to say, don't make your decision on a case-by-case -case basis, please, because you might make the wrong decision, like I did the other day. You need to be, you need to make the decision to wear two pairs of gloves and you need to do it always. Because if you don't, one day you're gonna slip up, is really what happens. And if your peers aren't making the right decision, try and encourage them. And I've given you, I hope, a raft or a suite of arguments that you can use and evidence that will support that argument. You might not find the perfect combination of double gloves to start with. So, you know, just as we're trying on a pair of sunglasses or we're trying to find a camera that feels good in our hands or clothing that makes us look thin and young and gorgeous, not like mine today, but, you know, it's personal choice has got a lot to do with it. So find that combination that works for you and hopefully your organisation will have enough choices for you to do that. Try the combinations, whether you have you know, smaller on the in or smaller size on the out, or whether you have two of the same size or whatever it is, or two that are bigger, a size bigger than what you usually wear. Find what feels good for you and what doesn't you know, affect your practice or your mindset. But standardise it, lay it down and let it become your behaviour every day when you get up. One of the good things to do around this is to use the two coloured glove system. Now, as I said to you, I'm an artist. I hate these colour combinations. On the colour wheel, they'd scream, ugly, ugly, don't put them together. But they work in the operating room. They work because this colour, as the inner glove, is easily seen through here. And what we know from the earlier research is that about 85% of the time, people don't realise their gloves are perforated. So you need something that, you know, if we had something, if we could let off gas, so we could have an alarm bell that rings when it gets perforated, that'd be great. <laughs> But until ANSA work out how to incorporate that, and I know they're probably working on it. No, I don't know that. But until they do that, we have coloured gloves. And they're important because you need to see when the outer glove has been perforated. It's high, it's 10% of all gloves, and it's not picked up routinely. Less than 5% of the time do people see it. So when you have two pairs of gloves, and they are these highly contrasting colours, People picked up in a study about 90% of the time, 85% of the time, that their outer glove had been perforated. So to me, it's a very obvious and safe way to do it. Don't wear two of the same colour because <coughs> won't, it won't be purposeful. Um, so we know more outer gloves are detected when you wear two gloves and it may help you have better glove practice and more frequent change of your gloves. So here's in my closing, really the points that I'd take back to practice if I had the opportunity to get back into an operating room. What I'd say to you is that you should routinely check your gloves and that if you've got a visual like that dark inside glove, it'll help you. Double gloves should be major, should be common practice, not just in major cases, but they should just be your routine practice. If you do find a perforation in your outer glove, I would change both my gloves because you just don't know that the inner glove is not perforated as well. 
And you need to do it because both bacteria and virus, they use those glove perforations as their highway. It's their TARDIS, their time machine to get straight through to you or to the patient, both of whom are at risk. You will need to experiment, I think, to find what suits you, what is comfortable for you. Um, use a colour system, make sure that the range of gloves are available if you influence glove purchasing, and think about some auditing. And I, I hope I can explore this idea a little bit more with Ansel about glove auditing and how we can do it properly. Always keep an eye on the policies, and if you don't want to do the research, know that Ansel and other companies who manufacture gloves and other devices, they know what that current research is, so talk to their salespeople, pick up a copy of Epic if you want to read more about it and see what the research is saying. So here are my three good reasons. First reason, you're in a risky clinical environment, you're at real risk, make yourself safe. If you do it consistently, you will be more likely to do it to be provenly protected and it will maximise your protection if you have two pairs of gloves. So I really appreciate spending time. Um, I know it's probably time for another session, but I'm happy to take any questions or commentary. Too much? <laughs>